of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me Come on, sing this out I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. darkness flee I raise a hallelujah right here in the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah oh fear you've lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing I'm gonna sing storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praise
Let's sing this one more time. Fix my eyes on you. Fix my eyes on you. No distractions can keep me away. Fix my eyes on you. Fix my eyes. Fix my eyes on you. Fix my eyes on you. No distractions. Keep me away, fix my eye on No distractions, no distractions Keep me away, fix my eyes on you No distractions, no distractions Keep me away, fix my eyes on you Oh, we thank you, Jesus church this morning it's through the lyrics of that song where we say we're fixing our eyes on Jesus that we're able to recognize the words of this next song that says you are enough because in the midst of everything that's swirling around us if our eyes aren't fixed on him it's easy for us because we're human to miss the fact that he's given us every single thing we need for the day. So let's sing this song together this morning. nothing I could do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more than I am right now Going through a storm but I won't go down I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now Cause you are a child You are enough Cause you are a child You are enough So I will be content In every circumstance On the mountain top, I can see so clear what it's all about. Stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't wanna forget how I feel right now. Cause you I can 
Father, would you even forgive us for the moments where we've relied on something other than you? Father, the fact that we don't have to come to you and improve anything for, for your love. Father, this morning I even thank you for that lyric that says, you are enough, so I am enough. Because so often it's easy for us to say, I'm not worthy to be loved by you, but it's through what Jesus did on the cross that makes us enough. Nothing by our own strength, nothing by our own might, nothing by what we can do, but only through Jesus. And so Lord, we thank you so much for your love this morning. Continue to remind us that you are enough in every situation, every circumstance, every mountain that is in front of us. We can rely on you to be our provider. So Lord, this morning, would you continue to reveal yourself in that way through your word, the things that, that you've done, that you are doing, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We pray that your spirit would continue to just rest on this place. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm excited to be here with each of you this morning. Don't mind this little back here. We're going to get to it here in a second. I'm not going to elementary school today. Um, but I want to say thank you for being here today. Welcome. We just talked about my favorite time of the year, um, all things Christmas thrill me like none other. Our home is decked to the halls all the way through, every inch, playroom, all the way up. We're ready for Christmas because we're excited for really what it represents in Jesus coming here for each of us. And um, I get to share this morning um, a message that God's kind of been brewing in me for quite some time. And as Josh always says, um, if you feel like you're going to throw up, you know you're doing the right thing. You know you need to speak it. And so that's me. I don't speak um, as often, because I don't necessarily love the process, but I know for sure that today um, the Lord has given me a word in this freedom series that I need to share, that I have to share, that I've personally experienced, and it's, um, it's really, the, the, re the reality of what it is, is freedom from, you know that we've been in the whole season of Jubilee, um, celebrating freedom. We've been doing freedom from and freedom for, and today we're going to talk about freedom from generational sin, and that's loaded. That's a, um, it's really been, in the research part of it, um, it's been like trying to wrap my arms around a big elephant, and I realized um, I can't do that. So we are going to be focusing in very narrowly on what I believe the Lord has shown me is really a root um, that is a root cause of all generational sin. And so we're going to unpack that. But first and foremost, I'm curious, as we were talking even about all the things Christmas, Christmas, the love of Christmas was birthed in me, um, truly, because I don't have a ton of childhood memories. Josh can just sit here and he rattles, um, he rattles his childhood memories left and right. And I'm like, I literally don't remember a ton, but I remember Christmas. And so I think that's probably one of the reasons it's near and dear to my heart is um, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the um, even just the, the uniqueness of what that meant with my grandmother specifically. There was just a sweetness of, of relationship and things we specifically did around the Christmas season. And so um, I'm curious for you guys this morning, and I get this is a dangerous question to ask because you might be sitting next to family, so just go ahead and prepare yourselves for that. But as you were being raised, so if some of you are gonna, it's gonna help you here that you're not necessarily sitting to someone from your childhood, but you might be. Um, as you're being raised, what was the environment of your home? Um, it could be all kinds of different things. It could be tense, it could be joy-filled, it could be sporadic, it could be hectic, it could be really um, well-organized, militant, it could be, so come right now, like 
scrolling through all the different things, how would you in one word describe the atmosphere of your home as you grew up? One word. It's kind of hard. I had like 20. All right, so now you're going to look to the person to your, to, beside you, and you get to speak that one word. So I'm sorry if you're sitting next to your mother or your father. <laughs> it's all good. We're not going to have to go to intensive counseling after this moment. So th- did you turn to your neighbor and you share? I'm hearing some words here. Chaotic. I'm terrified because my daughter's sitting here on the front row. (laughs) I will say that our home, um, I do like a really well-organized home, but our home is also insanely crazy, and it's loud. Uh, There's a lot of singing and music at any given moment, and Josh likes to complain that my singing specifically is tends to be more opera, which drives him crazy. Um, And I have a song for every single moment of any circumstance, and so literally (laughs) anything could be happening, and there's like a song that's coming out of me. And so really, our house is like a musical, and I'm sorry for every moment of that crazy. Um, but we at Grow Point, this is who we are. We are a community that is compelled by grace to grow. And the, my hope and my prayer for us as, we, or as I've been preparing for today is that we would be compelled this morning by the grace of God to grow in every way. Ephesians 4.15 is, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Christ who is head of the church. And this morning I ask for your permission to speak the truth in love. And it's a truth that um, you, you know parts of Josh and, and my story, bits and pieces that we've shared along the way. Um, but it's, it's having walked through um, specifically in this area of generational sin and breaking from it, having walked through that in really painful ways. We, there's been good and there's been bad. And the reality is every single person in this room, you have a family of origin. Um, and then if you add, if there's adoption story on top of that, and you also know that adoption is near and dear to our hearts, if you add adoption to that, so you have your family of origin, and then you have your adopted family. There's so many different layers. And if you're in a marriage, then both of you are bringing to the table family of origin and family of origin and all the different things of expectations, limitations. Um, there's blessings. I have um, full gratitude, even in the story of what our story is and a lot of brokenness. Um, part of my growing in every way and for other people speaking the truth and love into my life, part of it has brought me to the place, and this is my prayer for you today, is that you would be brought to the place that you are thankful for the family that God strategically placed you in, a particular family for a particular time, for a a specific season in all of history, you were placed in the family that you were placed in. And I understand that for some of us, that is a beautiful gift and there are incredible blessings. And for some of us, that there is grief and there is baggage that we tend to carry with us through life from some of that. Um, But I am choosing fully to acknowledge the gift that I would not be who I am today um, had I not experienced some of the broken things that I did experience. And I'm here today because I serve a God who sent his son Jesus to redeem me, to restore me, and to set me free from, from the lies of the enemy, to set me free for the things that were bound to my bloodline that are no longer a part of my bloodline. And I want you to have hope that we're gonna hit some hard things today, but there is hope because of the cross that is hanging above me that you can have freedom. You just have to choose freedom. You have to choose life. And so um, I have this right here because this past Sunday night, and students, please don't get stressed out. No names are attached to this in any way, shape, or form. Um, This past Sunday night, our growth students, they've actually been walking through a series that has been really hard, but really beautiful on sexuality. And what does that mean? What is our our sexuality um, of how God designed us to be? And this past Sunday night, they specifically talked about sexual abuse and and pornography. 
and how that plays out in their lives. And so um, Bailey was speaking this message, who, where is she at? Bailey did a phenomenal job. Uh, yes, I'm so proud of her. Um, but Bailey had, before she even started her message, she had a student that walked around the room carrying this bag. And she asked the students in the room, I'd like for you to write down on a sheet of paper, she handed out these sheets of paper, um, your first memory of your first sexual content, essentially, your first exposure to anything sexual. Um, I want you to write down when that happened. And so the students wrote these down and they wadded them up and a student walked around the room and they dumped each of these into a bag representing the baggage that we carry um, around with us uh, that's related specifically in this moment for them. This was related to some form of really sexual sin or sexual abuse that took place. And we went through these. There's no names, no students wrote names on these. Um, but I will say the consistent piece that blew me away about each of these um, precious sheets of paper is that students wrote as small as they possibly could, as close to the top of the page as they possibly could, that they would not be seen. Um, so even in how the students wrote on these sheets of paper represents an insane amount of shame. And the thing that breaked, broke and breaks my heart specifically about these sheets of paper is that so much of this was something that was done to them, an exposure given to them. Someone showed them something, someone did something to them, and yet here these students are walking around carrying a baggage full of shame that was never meant, it's not even a shame they're supposed to carry. They didn't do anything but exist. And I think in our family lines and our families of origin, some of us are walking around with shame bound to our backs. And some of the things that we, some of it we are active participants in, yes. But some of the things are things that have been done to us that we're standing and we're, we're, we're hostage to shame. And so I want to read just a few of these because this right here, guys, this is our church family as a whole, that we have to take note of this. This is hard to hear, but parts of this is generational sin that possibly we have handed off. We, all of us, have responsibility in this. And so I'm going to actually, they're so small, it's actually even hard to read them, but I'm going to do my best here on a few of them. The six-year-old me with my brother. Porn my cousin with her boyfriend, masturbation, experimenting with my cousin, nude photos. This girl sent me photos of another girl's nude. When I was five from my stepdad. Fifth grade, playboy. I was 10 years old and then porn in sixth grade. On the internet, especially Snapchat, fifth grade when I was on the bus, someone showed me their phone a picture of sexual content. Innocent bystander. I was 10 years old, I looked up photos of naked people and the list goes on and on and on. And as we open these up on Wednesday in our staff meeting, um, our hearts were truly broken. And we, we as a staff stopped cold in our tracks and we, we cried out to God. Um, because this represents a, like, the, ins the most insane small percentage of what we could figure out of what our students have been faced with, what they've experienced, what's been done to them, abuse that has taken place. They say statistically the average age that um, a child is now exposed to pornography is 11, that's average. Um, and so just the, the reality of how are we in this place? Um, and as we are talking about this message of freedom, this message of Jubilee, 
we have to ask ourselves, why, if we're free, if we've experienced the freedom that Jesus paid for on the cross for each of us, if we are free, then why are we seeing sins on repeat from generation to generation? Why are we seeing it happen when you can, you can track a family history? And right now, sexual sin is one that's highlighted right here in front of us, but the multitude different ways of what that could look like, why are we seeing this on repeat? I want to take a moment and I want to give us some other ideas of what this could look like because I feel like it's getting way too heavy in the room right now. (laughs) It's not fun when we start talking about sexual sin. Um, But here's some other things that this could look like of what generational sin might look like. And maybe you can identify this somewhere in your family line. So addiction. Drugs, alcohol, but if I can spell alcohol, sorry for the sloppy. Um, It could look like any form of sexual addiction. Identity, sexual identity, are we seeing that played out in our culture? You guys are really quiet, y'all can speak up a little bit. How about (laughs) a religious spirit? past from one generation to the next what about not trusting others i will say that this one is a huge part of my story not trusting others and specifically not trusting the church anybody else have that in your story (laughs) just me um how about lies secrets. When you hear of your family story, um, you can identify that over time, and it's usually after somebody's died, (laughs) that things start coming to the surface of things that we had no clue about. Um, Or here's another big part of my story. Racism. So as I was Processing all this, I really struggled, and Josh will tell you the struggle, and I kept coming back to him as, I want to so desperately honor my mother and my father, and I have no desire in any way, shape, or form to dishonor this morning. That is not my heart. But I do believe that in our fear of dishonoring and our loyalties tied to family of origin versus our loyalties to Christ, that I'm afraid that in our fear of dishonoring the earthly parents that God is giving us um, and our grandparents and our great-grandparents, I'm afraid that our fear of dishonoring keeps us from addressing a generational sin that is on repeat. And we have to be willing to address the generational sin um, for it to stop, to invite the power of the cross into our story, into our narrative for it to be stopped. And so if you're sitting here right now and it's getting really uncomfortable um, because it's like, I don't want to go there. My parents were perfect. I was raised in the church. There was no bad, like, you got to stop it. Because the reality is, every single person in this room, including myself, all of you, we are from sin. There is sin within us, and the sin cannot help but to bear fruit in some way, shape, or form. And so, yes, you have strong, rich heritage, but I guarantee you, somewhere along the line, there may have been something distorted that was handed off to you that wasn't okay. And so, um, in my own part of like the struggle with this, I was like, I don't want to dishonor, but I know that I, I have to bring a message of freedom. And I, it even came to a point um, for me specifically, um, raised in the South, deep South. And um, for as long as I knew <laughs> my entire childhood, I heard um, the most racist expressions um, that make me want to weep today. And I I don't share that to dishonor because my parents and my grandparents were handed brokenness. 
and they were handed a mess, and they did the best that they could in those moments of raising me. But my heart breaks today as a mom of a mixed child who is El Salvadorian, African-American mix, and I am so thankful. These tears, my heart breaks for what it was, but these tears are just such gratitude that we as a family would not be standing where we're at today if we would not have drawn a line in the sand and said enough is enough. And I looked my father face to face. We were actually sitting in Josh's office and I looked my dad in the eyes and we'd been having conversations about the way he he speaks about anyone that looks any different than us. And I'm not talking just skin color, but I'm talking any form of anything, of sexual identity, of anything. There was just, I love Jesus, but here is complete hatred in every form for anybody that looks any different. And I, I reached the point where I was like, enough's enough. Today it stops. Today, this generational sin, generational sin, it stops right here, right now. It will not be passed on to the next generation. <laughs> and that has been ugly. <laughs> that, has, that has caused a divide, but I, I am so thankful for the freedom that our family is walking in today because the hard conversations, one, acknowledging this isn't okay. This does not honor my Father in heaven. And my loyalty, first and foremost, lies to my Father in heaven. And then everything else gets in line with that. And if that means I have to say some hard things to my earthly dad, I will do it in the most honoring way that I know how. But church, we have to be willing to address some of these things that are wrong, that is sin, that is, is a narrative that is being passed on from one generation to the next. And so as you look through this list, this is a really, really, like I said, I can't fully wrap my hands around what all of this is today. As I look at this list, I want to look at what the opposite of this is. So, because I'm experiencing the opposite in our family, and I'm loving every second of it, and it's beautiful. Um, but for the opposite of addiction, I think it's really interesting, because most people would say sobriety. Great. Wouldn't that be a normal reaction that sobriety would be the opposite of being an alcoholic, right? Wrong, <laughs> which I was so excited. It doesn't mean that you just stop doing something. The opposite, and this was wrong for me too, I figured it out. Um, and this is where I believe uniquely that God is wanting to speak to us this morning. The opposite of an addiction is not sobriety. It's human connection. They did a study on mice that basically they put a, um, a mice in a cage alone and they gave it plain water and they gave it water that was laced with drugs. That, that mouse basically went to the, the drugged water and consumed that water, didn't drink the plain water. It was isolated alone and it died. That, that mouse would die when it was given the option between the two. They then put plain water and, and drugged water, water laced with drugs, into a cage where there were numerous mice that had fun wheels and activities. I don't know what all things mice do that are fun, but whatever. They put them in a cage with that, and you know what? Those mice lived because they had community. They had togetherness. They had, they had the ability to enjoy one. So they chose, without even having a clue, they didn't die. They drank the water that was pure. And so they're proving in sobriety, that it's not sobriety, that the biggest way to overcome being an addict of any form is human connection. So then after that, we have sexual identity, sexual addiction, and this, the opposite of that is intimacy designed by God. And I'm not being a teacher. I'm really writing this out for a reason. You'll get there. You'll see it in a second. 
The enemy has twisted and distorted what God intended for us as good. The enemy has come and twisted it and taken away, even from the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, it's, it was to strip away intimacy between the man and the woman and between God. So the opposite of sexual addiction and pornography and abuse and the struggles with sexual identity, it all comes back to having intimacy with the one true God. Then after that, we have religious spirit. Well, what's the opposite of religious spirit? It's relationship with God. What is the opposite of not trusting others, not trusting the church? Deep, authentic relationship. Lies and secrets, what's the opposite of that? Vulnerability. Racism, what's the opposite? Inclusion. The opposite of racism looks like this. It's Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people from God, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That is what the opposite of racism looks like is that one day before God, it's gonna be all of us worshiping him together. That is, and so when you look through this list, this was the part that I, I was surprised by, and God just really kept driving this home with me, that generational sin, the generational sin that you have experienced, that I have experienced, the generational sin that is represented here in these sheets of paper, that generational sin is rooted in broken intimacy. And the intimacy that God so desperately wants, I could spend the whole morning going through the whole Old Testament, but really quick, jump over to Exodus chapter 20. This is where the children of Israel get the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, this is a marriage vow that God is laying out with his children. They've come um, out of being slaves to Egypt, who Egypt was really messed up in their perception of gods. Even what we see with the 10 plagues, so as you're going to Exodus 20, when we, before, right before this, when their 10 plagues take place, those 10 plagues are specifically designed to address the gods that Egypt worshiped. So there was the God of fertility, there was the God of the river, there was the God of the rain, there was the God of, and so God's like, I'm the one true God, I'm the one, all, like all in all, one one true God. And I'm going to show you as I go through each of these plagues, I'm going to show you where each of you gods belong and that is defeated. And so um, he impacts all of this. And now Moses is standing before God. God is giving him the Ten Commandments. And we've, my entire life, the rebellion that has come out of me um, towards God is not understanding. And if students, I could get you to understand anything. The rebellion um, that possibly rises within us, these Ten Commandments are not a list of do's and don'ts. This is a love letter from our God, and this is a marriage vow. This is covenant language of saying, I desire to be in relationship with you. I desire to have intimacy with you, and this is what we're going to do for now. Um, he knows, God knows full well that these people are going to botch it, that his children are going to botch it, and there is going to be a need for a Savior that is going to handle the curse once and for all, for all of mankind. But until then, here is my vow to you. I will be faithful. This is what I'm asking for you in return. And so it says here in verse four, do not make idols of any kind, whether in shape of birds. Well, let's just start at verse three. That's really way more important. Verse three, do not worship any gods beside me. Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds or animals or fish. You must never Worship or bow down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not share your affections with any other God. I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I punish the children for the sins of their parents to the third and the fourth generations. 
but I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands even for a thousand generations. And we have a God here, it says, and I know for me, the moments that I've heard I'm a jealous God, I hear jealousy through the ways that we, can, we, we perceive jealousy, and that is, it's not good. It's, I, I'm, it's birthed out of anger. It's really from a place of sin. It's not pure, it's not holy, but really the way you could word this is, I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God, and I have passion, a burning passion for my people. I have a love. I have a, it's, it's like not even definable. It's not at, at a God of like, I'm a jealous God, I'm angry. It's, no, I'm a God who, who loves you, and I want all your affection. I don't want you to have all these other gods because I have all that you could possibly need. And so when we hear that jealous, don't get sidetracked with that. And then he says, and this is the whole concept of the generational sin, that I will leave, I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I punish the children for the sins of their parents to the third and to the fourth generations. And this is harsh. Like, I, until you come to terms with the reality of this, um, it seems harsh. Um, but the word punish here, um, or it could be curse, punish, but it really means, one, you are not standing before God, especially with the reality of the cross, you are not standing before God condemned because of the realities of the sins of your parents, okay? So go ahead and get the sin of your parents that is not on you. That what is on you is when you continue to repeat the same sins of your parents. And so this punish here means when it is being repeated. And the reality is, I think that a lot of us are repeating things and that are part of our family of origin that we don't understand that we're even repeating. And so that's where we need Holy Spirit to come in and reveal truth to our lives. Because there's moments where I'm caught in a, a a repetition of sin that I haven't even been able to identify as sin. And so you're not, it's not that you are guilty of the sin that your father committed, but you are guilty if you're repeating it. And we see that time and time and time again with the children of Israel. So I want to, it's basically idolatry here. So we, we think um, that idols I think we hear the words, they shall have no other gods before me, they shall have no other idols, and I think we kind of just check out, like, okay, well, like, we haven't, like, made a golden calf in the last week, so we're good. Like, we don't feel a relation to that terminology, but idolatry is not about the image, it's about intimacy, and so this whole message here of intimacy, this is what this is about, our God wanting to have intimacy with us, having our full heart, our full affection being his. And idolatry was a religious system against God, the one true God. It was a religious system. Now, I know that I have been caught up in religious systems in my life, and it's been religion. It's not been relationship. It's been a bunch of things, but it's definitely not looked like intimacy. And so we're gonna unpack idolatry and intimacy at a, a greater level, but I want us to understand that science is backing. Um, there is something called a study of epigenetics, and I've done more research on the, this than I would like to admit, but I, it's been intriguing to me, epigenetics. Um, I'm going to try not to get too scientific on you right now, um, but basically there is something that sits above the DNA that is explaining, ex ex telling our DNA how to respond um, to different situations. So it's either telling it to shut on, to turn on, or to shut off. Um, the the DNA epigenetics is proving that. Um, the DNA doesn't change, but the expressions of our DNA does change. So that can be from our diet. That can be from um, even cancer. Like, you look at the different things, but it also is environmental. So when I ask you the question, so what was the environment of your home growing up? That's important because it directly affects um, who you are today, who you see God as today. And they... Um, they say that even just one-off trauma events can actually affect 
be your genetics, the legacy that your genetics are creating that are taking place, the DNA and how it's being turned on, turned off to different sensations. And so, for example, for 9-11, they had 1,700 um, women that they have tracked who were closely related to the attacks that took place on 9-11, the trauma that took place on 9-11. There were 1,700 babies after the fact that they have done research on. And those babies were not present real time for the trauma that took place in that moment, okay? They, weren't, they were in the womb. But real time today, those babies respond to loud noises in a traumatic way, um, are more anxious. Um, they, even they talk about like just having, being introduced to new foods is traumatic to them. So there's different research of, that is a one time, that's not a, an event of on repeat, necessarily, but the one-time traumatic event had such an effect while they were on their mom, in the mom, and then given to them that real time today, those effects are, those, those are, that's what science is showing of how the effects are on these children. Then, take it a step further, I found this one really crazy. Um, this is really, here's a visual of epigenetics played out. So they trained um, mice basically to be afraid of like this fruity odor smell and the way that they trained them to be afraid of it is when the they would come encounter with the smell they would basically give them like a really s soft electric shock um, so every time they encountered that smell electric shock well 10 days after they've been trained about this they were allowed to mate those pups which came from that mating, um, they, didn't ex they exposed those pups to that fruity smell and they were afraid of the smell. They then went to the next generation, the grandchildren of those parents that took place, so now great, so two generations removed, those grandchildren were then exposed to this fruity smell and they responded in fear. That is literally, like scripture is confirming the word of God of the third and the fourth generations played out for us, you guys. And it is no joke, but the reality is we have the cross. Um, turn on over with me to Deuteronomy chapter 27. So the children of Israel, they received these commandments, then they had to receive the commandments again because what happened? They went and made a golden calf when they got annoyed that Moses wasn't coming back in time. Um, so the very one thing that they were told not to do, they do. Um, sound familiar? <laughs> but we come to this point, it's the end of Moses' life. And I'm gonna try to do a synopsis here for you, but we have to hit these scriptures. It's three chapters, I'm gonna do it in like five minutes. Um, but there's a moment here at the end of Moses' life, he's been told you won't go into the promised land and he's doing everything he can to prepare the children of Israel. He's being obedient and he's basically establishing um, this covenant. He's renewing a covenant that already, God had already pro promised to Abraham. Once already the children, like over and over, God's establishing, establishing covenant with his broken people that have a struggle with intimacy. And we come to this place where they're about 30 miles sitting outside of the promised land, the land that is flowing with milk and honey, the land that they get to rest in, this beautiful place. And Moses, is he, he's being obedient to God, and he lays out this renewal. So when you've seen like marriage vows renewed, that's kind of what I see this like, that they're renewing, God's renewing his vows. And he's, he's promising them and saying, if you will keep my commandments, if you will not seek other gods, if you will do this, if you will do this, I, this is what's going to happen. And so they basically take the 12 tribes of Israel. They put six tribes up on this mountain. They put six tribes up on this mountain. The Levites are in the middle. And they, um, the Levites are then told to speak out these curses. And then all the people, when they would speak these curses, all the Le Levites had to say, amen. Let it be. Basically, all the 12 tribes present before they enter to the promised land are hearing what the curses are going to be if they don't walk in intimacy with God and is saying, let it be, we're all in. And so I have to turn over <laughs> to the right place. In verse, chapter 27, verse 15, cursed is anyone who carves or casts idols and secretly 
Can we just secret? Lee is a key word throughout all of these curses. Secretly sets them up. These idols, the works of craftsmen, are detestable to the Lord. And all the people will reply, Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's really not a fun thing to have to be replied to, Amen, over and over again. I'm not going to read all of these curses, but I am going to jump down to verse 20. And if there's children in the room, I'm really not sorry, but just be aware, parents, and I'm going to hit some interesting verses of scripture. Because I think part of the problem is that we don't read these scriptures in front of our children. That's been part of our issue as the church. We've got to be willing to go there. Um, so verse 20, cursed is anyone who has sexual intercourse with his father's wife, for he has violated his father. And all the people will reply, Amen. cursed is anyone who has sexual intercourse with an animal. And all the people will reply, this is so not fun. Cursed is anyone who has sexual intercourse with his sister, whether she is the daughter of his father or his mother, and all the people will reply. Yes. Cursed is anyone who has sexual intercourse with his mother-in-law, and all the people will reply. Yes. <sighs> so fun. God is confronting. He's confronting the intimacy that has been perverted through the generations. And he's saying, no, you are my children. And though you did live in Egypt where they had some really dysfunctional ways of worshiping their gods, and I looked at some of those, I researched some of those things, and it's really disturbing the ways that they worshiped their gods. Um, that's what they're coming out of. That's who they were slaves to. And, and we guys are affected just as much as they were in their culture, you and I and our children and our children's children are going to be affected by the culture that they're living in. And this is a culture that is so perverse in all things sexual, in all things specifically, in all things with intimacy. And I, when I say the word intimacy, I hope you understand that intimacy is so much greater than sexual. Um, if you were here for the marriage, um, uphold marriage event that we did, Josh and I unpacked this. This intimacy was, it, it can't even be truly defined of what a beautiful piece it is of how God wants to connect with us. He uses um, this language of sexual intimacy to try to help us get a grasp, but it is a pure, holy, unashamed, I know you in every single way, and you know me in every single way, intimacy that these, these children didn't get. And so Moses is going for it. These are sins too. All of the sins that are listed here are sins that would have been done, that would have been more secretive, that would have been hard for just the general community to know about. So he's going after intimacy here. Then he jumps over. So there's the curses. Good times. He jumps to 28 where he goes into the blessings. And in the blessings, he's basically unpacking like, okay, this is what the reality is of disobedience. And here, if you're obedient and you're willing to, to do what I've asked of you, to be faithful to me, the one God, if you're willing to do that, here are the blessings that come. And this blessing list, basically everything that they would have gotten from their 20,000 different gods from Egypt, the one God fulfills. I'll hit some of the blessings, but you will be blessed with many children and productive fields. You will be blessed with fertile herds and flocks. You'll be blessed wherever you go, both coming in in and coming out. The Lord will bless everything that you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. Um, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in the ways of the Lord, he will establish you as his holy people. I love that he wants to establish us as his. In verse 14, it says, you must not turn away from any of the commands that I've given you today to follow after other gods and worship them. And he just goes blessing, blessings, blessings before that. And then it goes back over to curses. And it, it's beautiful, the promises that God wants to, to bestow on his, on his kids. Like, because he loves us. I know for me as a parent, I love love, love, love my children, and it gets a little out of control at Christmas time, uh, <laughs> because I want to bestow on them really good blessings, and um, so there's no, it's no different with our Father in heaven. He wants to pour out every, every, everything that he possibly can to take care, take care of us, but the reality is, are we acting like we're his? Are we, do we, does our life reflect that we belong to him? 
And then in verse chapter 29, hop on over to 29 and verse 11. He says, with your little ones, this is kind of wrapping up their ceremony. With, with you are your little ones, your wives and the foreigners living among you who chop your wood and carry your water. You are standing here today to enter into a new covenant with the Lord your God. New covenant, not necessarily new, but a covenant. New covenant's coming with Jesus. To enter into a covenant with the Lord your God. The Lord is making his covenant with you today, and he has sealed it with an oath. He wants to confirm you today as his people and to confirm that he is your God, just as he promised you. And he's, as he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. But you are not the only ones with whom the Lord is making this covenant with its obligations The Lord your God is making this covenant with you who stand in his presence today and also with all future generations of Israel. That includes us. We've been grafted in here um, with all future generations. Surely you will remember how we lived in the land of Egypt, how we traveled through the lands of the enemy nations as we left. You have seen their detestable idols made of wood, stone, silver, and gold. The Lord made this covenant with you so that no woman and no man, family or tribe among you, would turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations so that no root among you would bear bitter and poisonous fruit. This is the intimacy language that I believe that it's all, all generational sins are related to the broken intimacy part here that we're explaining. And where there is broken, where there is broken intimacy, we have a hard time seeing heavenly dad for who he is it becomes very distorted very quickly and when we get distorted in our vision of who god is we don't trust god and when we don't trust god we can't be intimate i can't be intimate with my husband if i don't trust him and what is happening with the children of israel on repeat is they have distorted views of God's plural, and they have a hard time remembering that God has been faithful. He, he literally delivered them from a land that they were slavery, and then he took them out into the wilderness, and he cared for every single need. At every single moment, he was there, he was faithful, leading them into this place, this amazing land where they get to experience true freedom, true rest, but they, they're distorted. And I, I wonder in our own lives, your fruit, your poisonous fruit, um, the root of bitterness that he's talking about here may not be playing out for you in these really big, like, okay, this one maybe, religious spirit, yeah. <laughs> but the rest of these, it may not be, you may not be struggling, though research would show that 67% of men who can proclaim to be Christians are struggling actively real-time with pornography. Where do, we, where do we fall into this? And what have we been trained from the DNA of our parents, the genetic legacy that we have been handed? How, what have we been trained to shut off? to turn on based on different sensations. What has, been, what has been literally handed to us, I'm talking spiritually, but also physically, we have been wired to respond in certain ways. Where do we fall at in this equation? Because our God this morning is saying to us, I desire intimacy with you. The rest of this is fake. The rest of this is a joke. This is what it comes down to. And when you unpack this, Reality is, is this is the cross, and my red marker is not marketing.
The reality is, because of the cross, no matter what the DNA points that have been handed off to you, whatever's been handed down, the cross brings freedom. The cross brings life. The cross brings blessings and not curses in each of our lives. If you turn over here to Deuteronomy, it's the last turn, I promise, chapter 30. This is what the final words Moses is kind of leaving here. He's wrapping it up. He says, today, today, that's right now too, today, I give you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life, that, you're, you, that you and your descendants might live. Choose to love the Lord your God and to obey him and to commit yourself to him, for he is your life. Then you will live long in the land the Lord swore to, you, to give your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Today, you can choose. And that's the beauty of what they've proven with even on the realm of all things scientific is that they've been, it's proven that you can retrain your DNA and the way, that resp- the way your DNA responds to different sensations, um, they've proven that it literally can be retrained. They've seen it play out real time, firsthand. And so we make choices daily, maybe by the second of right now, real time, I choose life. I choose blessings. I don't choose death. I don't choose cursings. And I'm not saying this because I'm bound in a religious system that's steeped in religion that is truly at its core against God. I say this because I have a God who loves me so much that while I was yet in sin, while he knew that I would be rebellious, while he knew that I would be disobedient time and time again, that he would send his son Jesus to die on a cross for me to become a curse, the ultimate curse for me so that I can have life and have freedom, that he literally was cursed on a tree for me, for you. So I don't say yes because of the religious system. I say yes because I have a God who loves me. And though I may never fully, this side of heaven, fully comprehend how wide, how deep, how great that love is for me, I choose yes because what I do know is enough. The children of Israel, they wanted, to cre- they wanted to create a God, and you see it with the golden calf. They wanted to cre- this is what they wanted to create, based on what they knew of religion. They wanted to create a God that they could craft with their hands. They wanted to create a God that they could guarantee will be present when they wanted it to be present. They wanted a God to fulfill their selfish gain, their selfish desires, we see this played out in the fertility God in crazy ways. We, we see this played out in that they, they wanted a God who was easy to them. They wanted a God who was convenient. They wanted a God who was normal. This God who had no face, who could not be described by man, who they literally had no physical representation of whatsoever. This God was not normal to them. Normal was this object that I could build, set it, and do like some crazy act of worship. That was normal. They wanted a God who was indulgent and even erotic. This is the type of God that the children of Israel wanted. And as I read through this list, I was cut to my core because you know what? There's times in my life where I'm like, I just want a normal God. And though I'm not going out and making an image with my hand, I am changing the rules of what he is. I'm changing the rules of what he's asked of me. I'm, I'm saying, you, I'm going to say, yes, I'll receive your peace. I'll receive your blessings. I'll receive all the good stuff. But when it comes to me actually saying, yes, you can be the Lord of my life. Yes, I surrender to you for your will to be done and not my will to be done. When it's full surrender, when it's full all in, Um, there's moments where I'm like, yeah, that's not the God that I serve. I'm making this God. And we do it in our own lives 
over and over again. He's saying, no, no, no. That's, that's, it's all in. And so in, in Deuteronomy 6, when Moses says to the children, he says, love the Lord with all of your heart. This is the exact opposite of what idolatry is. So if I could give you an opposite of idolatry, it is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with, with all of your might. All of your heart means all your desires. Um, it's your emotions. It's your attitudes. <laughs> attitudes, that's a biggie. It's your perceptions, the way that you see with all of your heart. I want it all, not just partial. I want it all. And then he says, with all of your soul, that's your whole heart and your entire being, but it's our body. It's our words. It's our actions. It's our reactions. And then he says, with all of your might, your strength, it's not just physical strength. You can't will (laughs) You can't will yourself as much as you think and as how strong you think you are. You can't will yourself out of these moments, right? Have we all learned this? Like we can't, I'm just going to try to not do this today. It is out of the abundance of being in an intimate relationship with a God who loves us that we can't help but to want to be faithful to him, to honor the marriage vows, to honor the covenant. We can't help out of an intimacy with the Lord to want to be in this place. It's not even, that this isn't even on our radar when we're living in this place. And so with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with all of our strength is literally all that I am should ring out that God is Yahweh. All that I am should ring out that he is, he is good, that he is the one true God, he is the only God. In my sexuality, it should ring out that God is the one true God only. In my marriage, it should ring out that God is the one true God. In my family, as a mom, as a daughter, as a pastor, as a you fill in the blank, wherever you fit into this narrative, whatever it is in your life, this is what the opposite of idolatry is, that all that we are is ringing out. God is the one true God. There is no other before him. There's no one else deserving of my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, of all my affections. It is him alone. Dr. Doug Weiss, who is a marriage counselor, said this. Don't think of it as a battle that you are just fighting for yourself. You are fighting for the very lineage that God gave you. And if you break this curse, then your sons and your daughters have a better shot and your grandchildren have a better shot. My son's name is Jubilee because his dad took the courage to break the curses off of him. I wanna invite you to do the same for those you love. Will you stand to your feet? You cannot break what you cannot name. The reason that racism has been broken in my family storyline from me moving forward is because I named it, is because I said it stops today, right here, right now, it stops with me. We need to ask God to show us through the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us areas that maybe we've been held captive into religion, that we've been captive to possibly playing church, that we've been possibly held captive to secret sins that that look like like this, so secret that it's itty bitty writing at the very top of a page that is very, like almost invisible. Some of us in this room, we're just living 
on lies that have been spoken to us about what our limits are. We're just gonna pause in this moment. I'm gonna quit speaking, but as it's silent in here, as the music's quietly playing behind us, Would you ask God to show you, to give you eyes to see the areas that you need freedom, the areas that have been on repeat from one generation to the next that you need to be free from today? Father God, I pray that as I'm even talking to you right now, that real time, maybe you're bringing memories to people's minds. Maybe you're bringing words that have been spoken. Maybe you're allowing them to see things that they encountered. Maybe whatever that looks like. But we invite that you still keep speaking even in this moment. And right now in Jesus' name, I declare freedom over each and every single generational stronghold that is represented in this room in the name of Jesus. I declare that that which has been holding people back, that which has been holding people as captives is being set free right now in Jesus' name. I speak over addictions, where there has been addictions to drugs, where there has been addictions to alcohol, all out of birth, out of a desperate need for human connection, a desperate need for intimacy with the one true God. It's birthed from that place of brokenness. Lord, I pray that you would set the captives free. I pray over sexual um, addictions, sexual identity, the question of sexual identity. Lord, I speak over these areas right now in Jesus' name and I declare freedom. I thank you that you have sons and you have daughters that are rising up in this place saying no more. I will not be shaped by a culture. I will not be shaped by a family of origin. I will be shaped to be righteous, to be, to be in right standing with the one true God, not out of a legalism, not out of legalistic standards, but out of desire of intimacy with my true God, to, true intimacy that he birthed, that is from him before it was twisted, before it was perverted, it was good. I stand in that today because of the cross. Lord, I thank you for those who, who come from stories of, of racism, that right now every lie, every thought, everything that we bought into, that we didn't even realize that we were buying into. I break it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare freedom, that truth, that all nations, that all tongues, that every tribe, every knee will bow, declare that you are Lord of all, and that we will one with one body worship you. We will not be exclusive to any, but inclusive of all, because we are all created in your image, God. I pray for every stronghold of religion that is in this place right now, that it would be broken. We cannot earn our way to you. We cannot good works our way to you of your approval. It is by grace and grace alone. It is by the power of the cross that we we have relationship, that we are, rede we are redeemed, that we are made free, that we are cleansed, that we are whole, that we are seen as righteous is because of the cross. Nothing of us expose the work of the enemy the work of the enemy to, to come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
we ask that you expose it right now in Jesus' name. The next question that I have for you is what is your, what is your generational transfer? A lot of what I've just talked about is what has been given to you. And as we talked about with the students, some of that wasn't things you asked for, that was things handed to you. But right now, real time, you've been told, today you get to choose life or you get to choose death. And in choosing that right now, you get to choose, no, this stops right here, right now. So what is your generational transfer? Some of us in this room, it starts with repentance. It starts with God, I'm sorry. I did not know that I had bought into a distorted lie. I did not know, but now I know and I'm gonna make it right. And godly repentance looks like this, that we are turning away from and we are turning to. We are turning away from this and we're fixing our eyes on Him because He is the only one who, who deserves our affections. Repentance looks like going to maybe some sons and daughters and maybe to some grandchildren that are attached to some of you in this room and saying, I repent. In Deuteronomy 6, when it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, it says, and tell these things to your children and tell them again. When you rise in the morning, tell them. When you go to eat lunch at lunchtime, when you go to bed at night, you repeat these things again and again and again to your children. And some of us in this room, we have not been faithful to tell our children and our grandchildren of the faithfulness of the one true God. We've been telling them what the news has to say about a political party. We've been telling them well, how messed up culture is, but we have not been telling them that we serve a God who is good, who is faithful. So Father, right now we repent. And I pray that it doesn't just stop here in this moment of us just saying, I'm sorry, because that's not what you're asking from us. You're asking to turn away from, to turn towards you with our full hearts, with all of our affection. So I pray that it doesn't stop right here in this moment, but that there's conversations that happen throughout this day, that there's conversations with our children, with our growth students standing here today. I'm sorry that I have not helped bring the healthy parameters in place to help us navigate a world of social media where you at 11 years old have been exposed to pornography. I am sorry that I have not been engaged, that I've been complacent, that I've been on the sidelines. I am sorry and that today, we as a family, we choose God, we choose life, we choose blessings. We're gonna sing the bridge to this song because it is the second part of Deuteronomy 6 when he says, tell your, tell your children and tell them again and again and again. Remind yourself when it gets going tough, remind yourself in the good and the bad and the ugly, remind yourself that you serve a God who I've always been there. And right now, this morning, you need to be reminded that you have a God despite your sin, despite your generational family of origin, what all has been handed, we have a God who's been consistent, who has said, I have never left you. I have never forsaken you. And we're going to turn our hearts right now and say, I remind myself, I worship you and I choose to worship you each day moving forward. Amen, church. Amen. Let's worship. Who you are. Remind me what you've done. Where you have taken me. How you Set me free
preach another message to you, okay? I promise. I believe that there is a responsibility on everyone's heart to to have some conversations. There are patriarchs and matriarchs in this room and there has been more of a commitment to the lineage and the loyalty to a earthly family legacy than the legacy of your heavenly dad. And I believe that there are some conversations that, that need to be had. And whether you are the deliverer or the recipient of the conversation, this is what we do as Grow Point but speaking the truth in love. Let us grow in every way into Christ. It does not say let us grow into our family legacy. It says let us grow into Christ. And so I've revised it. It's no longer if you feel like you're going to throw up, but if you feel like you've just got this fist in your, in your throat, like this lump, right? Just a lump pretty good physiological indicator that you need to have some conversations. Sam, I tapped you so you can come help me because I want you to help me make sure that we, we um, I want to make sure that we set off everybody the right way, um, talking about the grow card and if someone's new and all that good stuff. But here's my charge to us as a church. Pastorally speaking, I, I, want to, I want to know two things. I want to know what it is that you received, that, what's that one thing that you landed on today that was given to you that you didn't ask for? And then secondly, the second part of what Summer brought us to was what is it that you are going to say yes to, to, to send forward for future generations. So it's, it's two things, like what was given to you, like, no, it stops, it stops, this stops with me. And then what's the other side of the cross? What is that one word that's on the other side of the cross? And the reason why I want to know this and the reason why we want to know this is so that we as your pastors can pray behind the scenes that those, that, that the one thing be stopped and that you continue to move forward on the other side of the cross, handing off what you're supposed to for next generations, amen? So don't rush out of here. If you need to sit back down and write down on the, on the grow card, the one word, or the, you, you get what I'm saying, I'm not gonna repeat myself. We wanna know those things so that we can pray with you. So Sam, send them out, all right? <laughs> well, like Pastor Josh said, and on that grow card, if you didn't get a grow card on your way and there's one in the seat pocket in front of you, take a minute. If you are new here with us this morning, please make sure you fill that out. On your way out, there is um, a table out there in the lobby that says new here. You can't miss it on your way out. We would love to put a gift into your hands and just welcome you and say, welcome to our family. We're all a mess, so it's okay. We're all working through it. <laughs> But we, we love you, church, um, and so go this week and do, do some work. There's, there's work to be done, right? And so we will see you next Sunday. We love you all. Have a great week.